Hi guys. So today's episode is going to be on a relatively recent story that happened just a couple of years ago, and it uh, gained a tremendous amount of notoriety because of a videotape that was released to the public that went viral. And uh, a lot of you may have heard of it or at least seen the video of a girl who was kind of frantically pushing buttons in a hotel elevator and then acting kind of strangely um and that was like the majority of the footage that people viewed and then tried to analyze and figure out and that was the last known footage of uh this young lady um Elisa Lam and it was a very strange case because although the coroner has ruled it an accidental uh, suicide, I believe. But we'll see what the actual um, coroner result was. But, um, you know, there are just so many questions, and there were some also some very strange anomalies in association with this case. So I'm going to go through a uh, an article by um, All That Is Interesting dot com, and then we'll find another article which goes through some of the theories uh, that people have had over the years. Um, you know. People have uh, their numerous Reddit threads and websites and things like that that have cropped up over the years because people have just been fascinated by this case and wanting to explain, you know, possibilities as to what has happened. And I think part of the reason that um, so much of that is fueled has to do with all of the little weird elements, um, little clues, little things that were uh, sprinkled throughout this case, which didn't get any big, um, make any headway in the mainstream media, but definitely caught the interest of uh, armchair sleuths and and people who were trying to um, make some sense of it. Okay, so this is the vanishing of Elisa Lamb. I'm not totally sure if it's Eliza or Elisa. Uh, the I've seen now a couple of uh, documentaries. Some say Eliza and some say Elisa. I'm going to say I'll probably go back and forth because I've been saying Eliza for uh, the longest time. Um, but I think in some of the recent documentaries, they've been pronouncing it as Elisa. It probably is Elisa because Eliza would have a Z in it. But anyway, um, I might do that just by force of habit. Uh, so this is the, these are the two main images that were promoted in the press. There really aren't that many pictures. There's maybe like six total or something like that of uh, photographs that were released. And, um, even though she had active social media, there really weren't that many photographs of her uh, that were released to the public. So it's possible that her family just released a very limited amount, or these were the ones that were gathered from the internet, and, and that's all that anyone has of her, um, which has led some conspiracy people to think that, um, you know, there's more to this because it doesn't seem like a regular uh, profile. Is there, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But anyway, uh, so she was a student at the University of British Columbia back in 2013. So on January 26, 2013, Elisa Lamb arrived in L.A., she had just come by Amtrak train from San Diego and was headed to Santa Cruz as part of her solo trip around the West Coast. The trip was supposed to be a getaway from her studies at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, where she was originally from. Her family had been wary of her traveling by herself, but the young student was determined to go at it alone. As a compromise, Lamb made sure to check in with her parents every day of the trip to let them know that she was safe. That's why it struck her parents as unusual when they didn't hear from her from their daughter on January 31st, the day she was scheduled to check out of her L.A. hotel, the Cecil. The Lambs eventually contacted the Los Angeles Police Department. The police searched the premises of the Cecil but could not find her. Okay, so that's um, an image.
image of the Cecil. So I think later on in this article, they actually go into a little bit of detail about this hotel. It was located in kind of a seedy part of Los Angeles, and uh, it was a little bit surprising that she would even book herself at this particular location. Police soon released surveillance footage taken from the cameras at the Cecil Hotel on their website. This is where things took a turn into the truly bizarre. The hotel video showed Elisa Lamb in one of its elevators on the date of her disappearance, acting rather strangely. In the pixelated footage, Lamb can be seen stepping into the elevator and pushing all of the floor buttons. She steps in and out of the elevator poking her head out sideways towards the hotel's hallways in between. She peers out of the elevator another few times before stepping out of the elevator entirely. Um, so let's see. I hope this doesn't play with sound, but we might be able to see um, the footage. Okay, so she goes in pretty calmly. She very... Uh, you know, with a tremendous amount of confidence, presses very specific sets of buttons, waits, notice that the elevator door does not close, and then she waits, she peers out, she's clearly concerned that somebody might be coming, it looks as if she's hiding, and um, people have assumed that maybe she was playing a game, you know, like a, a hide-and-seek kind of a thing. Keep uh, noticing that this hotel elevator door is not closing, which is suspicious in and of itself. She kind of carefully peers out, jumps out, and... Okay, and I think this is the section where it looks like she's starting to talk to somebody. But I think she has to come a little bit forward uh, when we see her really making these um, big hand movements. Again, the hotel door is not closing. Okay, so then she goes back and does the sequence again. But I think she's doing a different sequence than before because she was um, pressing lower buttons. Okay, so this is where it looks like she's clearly talking to somebody. But then, in a way, it also looks like she's feeling around. Um, but but no, I think it, it does look like how some people, you know, are a little bit more... Um, they use their hands a lot to speak. And it does seem like she's speaking. at the end of it. I thought she comes into the elevator one more time, but maybe not. But again, notice how long this elevator door is staying open. Uh, that's weird in itself. Um, you know, it's been over a minute for sure. And I don't know. Yeah, okay, so now it closes, all right. Okay, so I think that was... Um, the rest of the footage, there's nothing more to that. I think the video just maybe plays out for a, a second longer, but she doesn't. Yeah, okay, so it opens, but she doesn't come back in or anything. Okay, so you see how fast the elevator door normally closes. Um, you know, that was just a couple of seconds. So something else was going on. Either the sequence that she pressed actually blocked the elevator from closing, or, um, I don't know, something is, is kind of strange with this door. Yeah, 
so you can dose maybe three seconds, it stays open. Okay. So the last minutes of the video show Lamb standing by the left side of the door, moving her hands in random gestures. Nobody else was captured on the video except Lamb. Public reaction to the inexplicable video crossed all the way to Canada and China, where Lamb's family is originally from. The four-minute video of Lamb's strange elevator episode has amassed tens of millions of views. Okay, so this is the top of the Cecil Hotel, and those are the water tanks. Uh, and I guess the tank that the firefighter is on top of is the one that she was found in. Okay. On February 19th, two weeks after the video was published by the authorities, maintenance worker Santiago Lopez found Elisa Lamb's dead body floating in one of the hotel's water tanks. Lopez made the discovery after responding to complaints from hotel patrons about low water pressure and a weird taste coming from the tap water. According to a statement by the chief of the Los Angeles Fire Department, the tank in which Lamb's body was found had to be drained completely and then cut open from the side to remove her five foot four frame. Nobody knows how Lamb's corpse, floating lifelessly next to the same clothes she wore in the surveillance video, ended up in the hotel's water tank or who else might have been involved. Hotel staff told authorities that Lamb was all, always seen by herself around the hotel premises. Uh, but at least one person did see Lamb soon before her death at a nearby shop eerily named The Last Bookstore. Owner Katie Orphan was among the last to see Eliza Lamb alive. Orphan remembered the college student buying books and music for her family back in Vancouver. It seemed like Lamb had plans to return home, plans to give things to her family members and reconnect with them, Orphan told CBS LA. When the autopsy results for Lamb's case came out, it only served to ignite more questions. The toxicology report confirmed that Lamb had consumed a number of medical drugs likely to be medication for her bipolar disorder, but there were no indications of the alcohol or if any alcohol or illegal substances in her body. Soon after the toxicology report came out, amateur sleuths began poring over any information they could find in hopes of solving the mystery behind the death of Elisa Lamb. For example, one summary of Lamb's toxicology report was posted online by the Reddit sleuth with an obvious interest in medicine. The breakdown pointed out three key observations. One, Lamb took at least one antidepressant that day. Lamb had taken her second antidepressant and mood stabilizer recently, but not that day. And Lamb had not taken her antipsychotic recently. These conclusions suggested that Lamb, who had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and depression, may not have been taking her medications properly. It is an important finding to note that given that the use of antidepressants to treat bipolar disorder can risk inducing manic side effects if done without caution, some sleuths have understandably latched onto this detail and suggested it was a likely explanation behind Lamb's strange behavior in the elevator. Hotel manager Amy Price's statements in court strongly support this theory. During Lamb's stay at the Cecil Hotel, Price said that Lamb was originally booked in a hostel-style shared room with others. However, complaints of odd behavior from Lamb's roommates forced Lamb to be moved to a private room by herself. But even if Lamb had been suffering from mental health issues, how did she end up dead? Furthermore, how did she end up in the hotel's water tank? The police did not slow any, did not show any foul play from 
from the evidence that was processed, but the coroner's office noted that they were unable to do a full examination because they could not examine the blood from Lamb's decomposing body. David and Hina Lamb filed a wrongful death suit against the Cecil Hotel several months after their daughter's death was uncovered. The Lamb's attorney stated that the hotel had a duty to inspect and seek out hazards in the hotel that presented an unreasonable risk of danger to Lamb and other hotel guests. The hotel fought back against the suit, filing a motion to dismiss it. The hotel's lawyer argued that the hotel had no reason to think that anyone would be able to get into one of their water tanks. Based on court statements from the hotel's maintenance staff, the hotel's argument is not entirely far-fetched. Santiago Lopez, who was the first to find Lamb's body, described in detail how much effort he had to exert just to find her body. Lopez said that he took the elevator to the 15th floor of the hotel before walking up the staircase to the roof. Then he had to first turn off the rooftop alarm and climb up on the platform where the hotel's four water tanks were located. Finally, he had to climb another ladder to get to the top of the main tank. Only after all that did he notice something unusual. I noticed that the hatch to the main water tank was open, and lo I looked inside and saw an Asian woman lying face up in the water approximately 12 inches from the top of the tank, Lopez said. As reported by the LA List, Lopez's testimony suggested that it would have been difficult for Lamb to make it to the top of the water tank on her own, at least not without anyone noticing. The hotel's chief engineer, Pedro Tovar, also made it clear that it would be difficult for anyone to access the rooftop where the hotel water tanks were located without triggering the alarms. Only hotel employees would be able to deactivate the alarm properly. If it was triggered, the sound of the alarm would reach the front desk as well as the entire top two floors of the hotel. Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Howard Holm ruled that the death of Elisa Lamb was unforeseeable because it happened in an area that guests were not allowed to access, so the lawsuit was dismissed. So that's basically the end of the story as far as the public story of Elisa Lamb is concerned. Um, now there's a little bit in this article about the backstory of this particular hotel. So as I mentioned, it's located in kind of a, um, a poor neighborhood um, in downtown Los Angeles, and it is a historic site. Um, there are many hotels in that area that were built, I guess, in the 1920s, and are designated historical sites, but, you know, they have not been, the area has not been maintained, even if the, some of the buildings have been. Elisa Lamb's mysterious demise was not the first to happen at the Cecil Hotel. In fact, the building's sordid past was earned as a reputation as one of the most supposedly haunted properties in Los Angeles. Since opening its doors in 1927, the Cecil Hotel had been plagued by 16 different non-natural deaths and unexplained paranormal events. The most famous death associated with the hotel, other than Lambs, was the 1947 murder of actress uh, Elizabeth Short, a.k.a. the Black Dahlia, who was reportedly seen drinking at the hotel bar in the days before her grisly demise. The hotel has also hosted some of the country's most notorious killers. In 1985, Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, lived on the top floor of the hotel during his monstrous killing spree. The story goes that after a murder, Ramirez would dump his bloody clothes outside the hotel and return half naked. Back then, the hotel was in such disarray that Ramirez's nude stunt barely raised an eyebrow. Six years later, another murderous patron moved into the hotel. Austrian serial killer 
Jack Underweger, who earned the nickname Vienna Strangler. With such a macabre history, one could think that the Cecil Hotel would soon be condemned, but actually the old building was recently granted landmark status by the Los Angeles City Council. The hotel was given the distinction because of the building's opening back in the 1920s, which is considered the beginning of the lodging industry in the U.S. Meanwhile, the death of Elisa Lamb at the hotel has inspired pop culture adaptations like Ryan Murphy's American Horror Story Hotel. During a press conference for the show, Murphy stated that the new season was inspired by a surveillance video from a Los Angeles-based hotel that surfaced two years ago. The footage showed a girl in an elevator who was never seen again, an obvious reference to Elisa Lam and her bizarre elevator episode. More recently, a gaming studio came under, the fu- under fire after users of the game Y2K, a postmodern RPG, found undeniable resemblances to Lamb's case in the storyline. In one scene of the game, main, the main character, Alex, received a video file showing another character, Sammy, in an elevator. The elevator door opens to reveal an alternate dimension on the other side. Sammy is then captured by a demon, kicking and screaming all the while. In a 2016 interview with Waypoint, Andrew Allenson, a co-founder of Axe Studios, which is the company behind the Y2K game, um, talked about how the death of Elisa Lam had influenced its development, saying that there still hasn't been a great official story about her. I remember on local news they reported it from the Groves Point out angle because people drank water that a corpse had been floating in, and that's unfortunate. But what about the poor girl who died? Isn't it easy to say she was off her meds, but why can't people think a bit more about her as a person? Well, in answer to the mystery behind the death of Lisa Lamb remains unclear, the obsession surrounding that mystery has remained in the public consciousness ever since. Okay, so we're now going to go to another article which goes through some of the theories and also brings um, a few points that have not been mentioned in this particular uh, article that uh, really inspired a lot of people to further investigate uh, this particular story. So let's, we'll go to that in a second. Okay, so um, this article is from Ranker, and it basically goes through 12 different theory possibilities as to what might have happened to her. So I'm not going to go through every one of them. I'll just mention some of the basic ones, and then we'll talk about the ones that I'm actually interested in as uh, likely possibilities as to what happened. So um, the official story is that she, uh, you know, was having a manic episode and then got, you know, onto the rooftop somehow and into the water tower and uh, drowned accidentally. And, you know, that was uh, how she uh, uh, accidentally maybe committed suicide. So the issues with that particular Um, There are a couple of issues with that one. The first thing is um, she would have to know that, one, there are even water towers up above the hotel. Two, she would have to know how to get to them. Three, she would have to know how to, um, you know, block the alarms from sounding. And she would just have to have a lot more information uh, than a traveling guest would normally have. So it is unlikely that she did all of these things on on her own. Now, an update to that particular angle has to do with the police report that said that her scent was noted by the um, dogs all the way up to the window that, um, you know, she supposedly 
escaped from to go up out onto the balcony so her scent is in the hallway and then it is no longer there once they get outside the window so that's kind of interesting because she was maybe obviously in the hallway but um if she was carried out of the window and then did not walk you know the rest of the way up you know over the gravel and then uh, I think there were two sets of ladders she had to climb. Um, if she did not do those but was actually carried, then it would make sense that the dogs did not, um, you know, have a scent trail because it stopped right at the window. She may have scuffed or, you know, some part of her body might have hit the window pane or something like that, but that's where her scent ends. And it would not have had she been, you know, making that journey on her own, like crossing through the window and walking up on the gravel and I think they were too, you know, she'd have to hold on to those staircases. They were very thin, difficult to climb staircases, by the way. And um, so I have a feeling that she was carried and was not walking those steps. Uh, the other thing that police noted was she did not have gravel on her shoes. Um, so she would have had some sort of gravel residue on her shoes had she walked the entire gravel pathway up on top. So she didn't have that either. So I think that also um, kind of lends to the idea that she was probably carried um, the rest of the way past the window. She might have been running in the hallway or something happened in the hallway is what I think and uh and then was carried the rest of the way up so um that kind of eliminates in my mind the possibility of her getting up there on her own because she would have to know how to do it and also have the strength to do it it was uh it's very difficult the amount of uh the climbing up there is very difficult and then also getting into the tank is very difficult it was like the size of the hole is practically her size so she would have to really um push her way in there her clothes were also wrapped which i mean that doesn't even make any sense that her clothes are wrapped and lying next to her in the water so she's floating on top and just a couple of inches from the top and then her clothes are right there and nobody does that you know if you're in a manic state are you wrapping your clothes and then um you know carefully placing them so that they are lying right next to the you know I, I don't know it just doesn't make any sense and then on top of it the um the uh, cover was closed. It wasn't locked, but it was closed on top. So again, how is she doing all of this on her own? So I don't think that she did that on her own. Um, now, okay, so then the other theory is that somebody obviously, uh, somebody else was involved. So let's read what this one says. One of Elisa's blog posts apparently complained of some creeper while staying at the hotel. It's entirely possible that some guy was stalking her and whether on purpose or not was responsible for her death and tried to hide her body. Lamb was found naked, yet her clothes were thrown in with her and her phone was missing. There was evidence of anal bleeding. However, it was blamed on her body decomposing in the water tank. It's unclear if she was given a rape kit or if she was ever processed and she was not tested for common date rape drugs. Um, so that's also another interesting point. They were only testing for a uh, certain variety of of drugs or they just basically looked at what was in her stomach content um but it was not a complete autopsy by many people's standards uh now the other issue comes with this creeper at the hotel okay so um i've been actually <laughs> reading about this story for the last couple of months and I i've tried to post it several times i've had some difficulty posting it um that is the reason for such a delay. Hopefully this recording will get through. But in any case, um, it's given me a lot of time to watch.
watch a lot of uh, videos and um, documentaries and stuff, and I also uh, got a hold of her old blog post, or um, uh, I think it was on Tumblr, and was able to read through all of this information. And, um, you know, some people say that the Eliza Lamb character is completely fake, but, you know, when you read the amount of information that was on the Tumblr post, which I can't even find right now, I mean, that's kind of unfortunate. I don't know if it's been wiped from the internet or what happened, but a few months ago, I was able to go through it, and there was such, so much information that I don't necessarily think it was a completely, uh, I don't think she's a fabricated character. I think she was a real person. Um, and she was basically going through some issues, some of which I feel she was possibly over medicated for, um, you know, over prescribed medications because based on what she's talking about, they were not outstanding issues that would warrant the kind of heavy dosing that she was given right in the beginning. So basically just to go through um, a little bit about that. So there she is um, in high school. It's her senior year. Senior year can be kind of stressful, especially if you are applying to college. And so that little interim period, um, it's just, I guess, a little bit before the end of the second semester, um, you know, until you start getting the results back of the applications that you sent out. Um, it can be a little stressful, you know, in that process, waiting for the results to come back. After that point, senior year is, you know, very fun because there's no stress. Um, but you know, she was right at that phase when a lot of people are stressing out. So uh, she had applied to schools. She was waiting for the results. She was having a little bit of anxiety about that. Nothing in her blogs were, um, you know, outstanding in terms of her experiences. It was something that I went through that I'm sure many people have gone through just, you know, being a little stressy about what was going on. But she did go to a counselor and the counselor recommended her to a health care worker. And in Canada, it's relatively easy to just jump from your school counselor to get a doctor's appointment, which doesn't really happen in the United States. You'd have to kind of do a little bit of work on your own, but the counselor can just call over there and get an appointment. And so that's what happened. And based on whatever she told the counts, I mean, the um, healthcare worker, she was prescribed a whole, uh, you know, set of uh, drugs for bipolar disorder, which I feel was kind of an excessive recommendation. Now, I don't know everything that she told the healthcare worker, but based on her um, blogging about it, and she was definitely talking about everything to do with all of, you know, her various issues. She had never had a manic episode prior to this. She had never, her parents had never noticed anything that would categorize her in the area of, um, you know, having manic episodes, highs or lows, to a degree that it would categorize her as bipolar. So if she was going through stuff, it was very minimal, but yet she was prescribed a pretty heavy load of medication medications. And what ended up happening is when, once she started taking them, she started noticing that her normal energy level of for completing tasks and just getting up in the morning was severely depleted once she would take her medications. It would just bring her to a point of not being able to function. And this is why I think she was overprescribed and probably needed to see another doctor uh, to get a, you know, assessment done. She probably needed to regulate the meds that she was on. And uh, she, that never happened. So what she was doing um, was basically taking a pretty high dose. And she noticed that her normal functioning, because she was like a high functioning student, um, you can say that that was because of, you know, having uh, a little bit of a manic tendency. But 
but she was very consistently working. She was hardworking. She had good grades, and she was socially active. Um, she was not going into frenzies or anything that anyone noticed. Um, and she was, you know, just a high-functioning student who was then going through a little bit of stress when it came to university time. And uh, so anyway, so she started taking this stuff, noticed a drastic difference, you know, in um, her ability to just do normal tasks and, you know, be active in the world the way that she had been. Anyway, by the time that she got to college, um, she, you know, had started out with this normal four classes for the first semester, and within a three weeks, she had dropped it to one class, and then within a week of taking that class, she had reduced it to an audit, meaning that she was not going to get a um, grade for the class, and the reason was, according to her blog, and she was blogging daily, she could not even get up in the morning, um, you know, as soon as she had taken her medications, like she would wake up, have breakfast, have her meds, and then just not feel like going anywhere, and then just get back in bed, whereas um, before her meds, she was actually okay. So um, I think she started to notice that certain medications, certain ones of those, um, whatever her set of pills were, uh, were causing her to get very, uh, were causing a lethargic effect. And so she um, decided to self-regulate, which is probably not the best idea. She should have gone to a doctor and they should have adjusted her dosing. But in any case, she stopped taking certain ones um, because it was, she couldn't function. As soon as she dropped, I think one of them, um, she was able to get up. She could, you know, go out, have coffee with friends, you know, do whatever. At this point, she didn't have any classes, really. I mean, she had the one audit class, but she had a lot more free time. So she was blogging, she was writing poetry, she was a lot more mentally active, and she was even noting that she, you know, is a lot more active once, now that she was not taking something. Um, she didn't specify as to which one it was, but then even in the autopsy, it showed that for several months, she had not taken a particular pill. Now, People say that that could have caused the manic episode, but she didn't even have a history in the last few months of any kind of a manic episode appearing just by not taking that uh, particular medicine, medication. So although it wasn't the right thing to do, she, she needed to get some sort of medical um, assessment done, reassessment done. She was sort of doing it on her own. And uh, in any case, she had become a little bit more active by the end of that semester. So she's, you know, rounding out the semester in her blog. She mentions talking to a guy on the internet that she is interested in. She doesn't give a lot of details about him, though. And um, suddenly, out of nowhere, she, um, you know, she makes this plan of taking this trip to across the um, West Coast, you know, from uh, British Columbia down the coast to California. And it seems like it came out of nowhere. It's not like she has been fantasizing about this or, you know, showing pictures of the beauty of California or something like, you know what I mean? Like people sometimes have dreams of going to certain locations. They want to go to Italy or whatever. You sort of hear about it over and over again. This was like strangely out of nowhere. She had no plans of traveling. And then suddenly she had this big itinerary planned of what she was going to do going down the coast. And I have a feeling that this had to do with this individual that she was talking to on the internet. So she was very vague about her interactions with this person. Um, it was unclear if she had met him in Canada, so I don't think she actually had. I think the plan was to meet him in California. And then when we get later on her blogs, she does go out to lunch with somebody once she arrives in California, where 
where she supposedly doesn't know anybody. So I think this is the mystery person that she had been talking to. And it's also probably the reason that uh, she did not want to go with anybody. Like when she brought this idea to her parents that she wants to go on this trip. Um, they were very reluctant about it. They encouraged her to go with her sister, which would have made some sense, you know, go with somebody or go with some friends, you know, most of the time. Uh, people don't just take these trips by themselves, especially when they're so young, and especially when they don't have a, a tendency to do this kind of thing. I know people in college, they go um, backpacking and stuff like that, but usually there's a little bit of a precedent set up for that. This kind of came out of nowhere, and everybody was very surprised because this was really like a homebody kind of a person. So where did this idea crop up from? It was kind of surprising. She was very insistent that she has to go, and she was very insistent that she goes alone. So I have a feeling she was going to go to meet a guy, and she didn't want her sister involved because I have this guy apparently was not Asian, and, you know, you come in, if you're coming from a conservative sort of family, um, Asian family, then it can be sort of difficult to introduce a non-Asian into the mix and have, you know, parents accepted and whatever. And so I think she was avoiding that situation altogether. So she didn't want her sister, all of her friends, majority of her friends were Asian. They were all friends of the family as well. And so if that word would have gotten back, if there was some sort of rendezvous with this uh, outsider, so to speak. So I think she was keeping it secret. Now, who is this guy that she was, uh, you know, going up to meet? Well, on her Twitter, she has a regular Twitter account. And then she also had an account that was, um, her name was flipped, Lamb Eliza. And on the Lamb Eliza, there is one contact. And that one contact is a U.S. Army officer who is stationed in South Korea. And uh, he was, you know, a Caucasian. And apparently they had some sort of contact with each other. But this was like a separate account for her. And probably the account that she didn't want her friends or family or whomever to be aware of. And I think that's possibly who she was going to be meeting is that's what I think was going on um and uh, her twitter account has uh, one other interesting fact which we will get to I think when um they mention it a little bit later on so anyway for that part of it uh, I, I do think she was going to go and meet somebody I mean she did meet somebody when she was in Los Angeles she's going to have lunch with somebody that is also where she lost her phone which is what I think very significant because if somebody has some kind of a plan, you know, to do something nefarious um, and then you have a girl who is constantly blogging from her phone, the best thing to do is get rid of that phone and she lost her phone on that lunch date that she went to and it's very easy, you know, for something like that to happen. You're sort of excited talking to this new person, maybe she gets up to go to the bathroom or whatever, and they pocket the phone, and that's the end of it. What's interesting is, although she lost the phone, um, blog posts were continuing to come from the phone um, all the way past her death date. Uh, updates were continually coming in, so some were saying that, oh, these were automatic updates, but these were not automatic updates because she's giving her opinion, uh, supposedly, about places that she is visiting during that time. So that's not possible. Why would you do an automatic update for a place you haven't even been to yet, saying how fantastic it is? And people also noted that the um, tone of her uh, posts, her update posts after the phone had gone missing that were coming through still uh, were not in line with the way that she normally used to blog because she had a very lyrical way of talking, a lyrical way of posting. Everything was kind of poetic. She would notice little things and um, they were long, they were long uh, explanations and there was a, a 
sense and uh, why they were not, you know, they should have been something that they, you know, that would have been the easiest thing to do, I would think. Um, they always claim that they're able to track these things. And this is a phone that's functioning because it's posting. They should have been able to locate it. Anyway, no effort was made towards the phone, uh, which is very surprising. So we do have this one connection that she did meet someone in Los Angeles and um, lost her phone. And then shortly thereafter uh, also, uh, you know, ended up in this water tower. Um, and I have a feeling that uh, this was also the individual who suggested for her to go to this particular hotel because she was, if you look at her um, itinerary of hotels, she was staying in normal hotels, budget hotels, but in normal areas that, um, you know, were, it would make sense for somebody to, you know, uh, a young girl to, to, um, who's traveling alone to be in a little safer environment. Uh, suddenly, out of nowhere, she gets a booking at this very seedy hotel um, on Skid Row in Los Angeles in a very unsafe environment. And it's not like she has some history of really loving the macabre and dark stories and stuff like that. She doesn't. So it's very strange that she would even pick this hotel. I don't think that hotel was picked randomly. I think the individual that she was in communication with suggested this particular hotel because she only went there in the last couple of days. And, uh, and I think that it was a purposeful decision, um, by this other person. So he, had, uh, again, they never investigated who this lunch date was with. I mean, I don't know what to say. The police just focused on one angle and did not try and investigate anything further in terms of like, who did she meet while she was in Los Angeles? She's blogging about going to lunch with somebody. So she met somebody, find that person. And that's the day that her phone goes missing. I think that's pretty suspicious. But anyway, um, okay, that's I, something that I think is kind of significant. All right, so let's go to the next one. Okay, so in this next one, it has to do with this strange anomaly um, that has uh, uh, this movie called Dark Water that came out a couple of years prior um, in 2005, uh, starring, it was in this, Jennifer Connelly, I think. Um, I don't know if it says, but anyway. Uh, so here's this movie that has eerie similarities to what happened to Elisa. Elisa Lamb's death is so eerily similar to the horror movie Dark Water, released in 2005, that it almost seems as if it were by design. A case of life imitating art, perhaps. Elisa Lamb's death could have been caused by someone trying to emulate a Hollywood film. Not only did the film depict residents of an old haunted building complaining of foul-tasting dark water coming from their taps, but the cause in both instances was a girl decomposing in the water tank on the roof. If that weren't a creepy enough connection, the film's main characters are a mother named Dahlia and her daughter named Celia, Cecilia, like the Black Dahlia and the Cecil Hotel. There are also elevator malfunctions, and a young Cecilia can be seen talking to thin air in the elevator because her imaginary friend is there. Okay, so this is where a lot of the um, conspiracy people, well, there are two angles that the conspiracy guys have jumped on. One has to do with this video that was released, and um, as you recall, watching the video, she very confidently walks into the elevator and presses a series of buttons, and then, you know, the rest of the behaviors play out. Okay, now, um, when I first saw this case a couple of years ago, uh, the, all of the uh, YouTube videos about it were uh, in relation to this thing called the elevator game, which I had never heard of, but apparently it was some sort of a Korean game where you go into an elevator, press a button, go to that floor, get off, uh, press another button, go to another floor, and 
and you do this series of jumps from one floor to the next. And then finally you get off and it's supposed to be another dimension. There's some woman that's supposed to come on. You're not supposed to look at her. And it's one of those, you know, kind of kids games. If it's even a game, I'd never even heard of this, but it just uh, took over the internet in regards to this particular video coming out and everyone claiming that she's playing this game. And the thing is, uh, she's not playing that game in the elevator because, like I said, that is a series of single button presses, going to floors, coming off, doing that. But she didn't do that. She went into the elevator, pressed a series of buttons, and then waited. So she had, like, as if a code, like she knew which buttons to press, she was told maybe, which buttons to press, which sequence of buttons to press, and as you recall, that elevator door did not close for the full four minutes of the video. Then once it started functioning normally, you saw how quickly it was closing. Uh, after opening, it was like three seconds, because elevator doors don't stay open for four minutes, uh, just so that a person can view you know, a full camera view of this bizarre incident. So I think that she was told to go to this particular elevator. I think that whoever told her to knew about the camera and that something was being displayed in terms of her behavior as far as uh, this particular video footage was concerned. So now we go back to one of her Twitter um tweets, one of her tweets on Twitter, which has to do with this um, invisibility cloak. So she was a Harry Potter fan, like a lot of girls her age. And, um, you know, the, in Harry Potter, they have this thing called the invisibility cloak. It sort of caught the imagination of whoever watched the movies or read the books and so forth. Anyway, so she tweeted about a company who was producing a invisibility cloak. The um, Illumination Company or Light and Magic or something like this, I can't remember. Maybe it'll say in one of the um, other posts. But anyway, this company was supposedly making this cloak. Well, guess where that company has a an office? At the Cecil Hotel. So this company, um, I don't know why I'm forgetting the name, but uh, hopefully it'll be in one of these posts in a second. Um, had an office at that particular uh, location. Now, when you look up their uh, information, like what does this company do? It doesn't say that it makes invisibility cloaks. What it makes is a self-immersion rooms using AI technology. So what it is, is that you go into a room that looks like a cubby hole, looks like a, you know, nothing. And the person who is walking into the room, they are seeing a completely um, fabricated environment. And they're doing so without using the, you know, VR glasses. They're not using um, a machine. They're walking in normally. Anybody viewing them from outside only sees them in the room. They don't see all the AI stuff that is done inside the room with some kind of uh, light and technology that they are specializing in. This particular company is specializing in. The guy who is the main founder of the company is named Anthony Fu. Anthony Fu his next job after this particular um, project was a uh, post in the South Korean army using um, visual effects for uh, military uh, use. Like they, they was, it wasn't specific, but it was uh, something to do with creating these AI kinds of constructs. And that was his area of expertise. Who is this Anthony Fu? Was that the guy she was meeting? I don't think so. Um, but he clearly was involved with this sort of a thing. And he had two other partners um, that we don't know have too much information about. We just have Fu's because he has a little bit more of an extensive resume. So that's why there's more information about him. But just the fact that he also, that his next job is a military contract and that she is supposedly friends now with somebody involved with all 
also the military in South Korea, and now we're getting a couple of these connections, and that the suggestion, I believe, is made for her to go to this hotel where this company has a rented uh, a room as their offices. So, um, I don't know. It's, it's pretty, I think, suspicious already. So, what they specialized in were self-immersion rooms. Now, if you go back to the video, it does look like she, at some point she walks out and is feeling around as if she's trying to feel uh, if something is real or not real. Now, the thing about the video is it was sped up a little bit and there was one minute of footage that was also removed and um, that's by the time the police released of that recording so the question is why did they release a doctored recording and what did that one minute show did it show somebody passing if so who you know like i mean you can block out their face but uh you know what why is that minute missing what is in that minute that's missing um so if for example this uh, particular company specializes in immersion rooms where they're saying that the outside viewer sees only the person in the room but they don't see what the person is seeing this could be a public display of this particular technology um, which is maybe why that video was so long and you have a four minute video with the door staying open um, where this girl is seeming to act strange but only people who are in the know would understand that oh she was actually seeing something that we were not able to see and this is the real life example of it now do they do these kinds of things as military exercises yes they do these kinds of things and do they get released to the public in bizarre ways yes there are plenty of examples of real life um you know military exercises that then get released to the public the public is told a completely different story that oh she's having a manic uh episode or whatever the heck it's played up that she's bipolar and all of these other things and uh in fact the video is showing something very different that she is responding talking to somebody where you cannot see but she is seeing and um, it's possible that that, because that's what they specialized in, that's what they were doing over there. So it's possible that they had, you know, rented out an entire area of a floor and they had made this entire floor one of their larger experiments and she was on display publicly performing and without really knowing that she is part of this exercise. Um, so there, there could be something like that going on. Um, the other elements when it comes to this particular, uh, you know, issue of a film coming out first uh, leads people down the track of predictive programming, which I think is significant anytime there is a military false flag exercise. There almost always seems to be an element of predictive programming, and it comes through movies and cartoons. If you look up videos of The Simpsons, and predictive programming. You'll see all kinds of things. Uh, Family Guy also has a couple of episodes that seem to lend to predictive programming. So what is that? So it's basically them showing a version of something that's going to happen in the future. And it is a way of, uh, you know, according to the predictive programming idea, um, placating the public so that they get used to the idea so that when the actual thing is seen, um, they are not overreacting to it. That's one explanation, but there's also an occult aspect to it. Um, and that has to do with the idea of lesser magic, which is the concept of laying out a uh, plan in a fictional way, in a way that people are not going to respond to uh, in any sort of reactionary way. Uh, laying that out for the public, there is no um, retaliation for it. And so the belief is that then there is no karmic effect once the actual event goes through. It also is sort of laying the playing ground for the actual event, which is the actual spell. Um, and if you look at some of the military connections with the occult, especially in the last 60 to 70
70 years, you'll find a tremendous amount of links that um, there are connections, especially when all of the Germans who were very much involved with the occult um, during the Nazi period, the Vril Society, the Black Sun, the uh, Thule Society, all of those guys, all of those Nazis who were heavily into occult stuff came into the United States through Project Paperclip, and that influence influenced the American military branches that they were involved with. NASA was developed by the uh, disciple of Aleister Crowley, um, Jack Parsons. So he was going to be the next Aleister Crowley for the OTO, Aleister Crowley's uh, organization. And this is the guy who also um, is the founder of NASA. So there are a lot of occult aspects to many of the military organizations that came about after the war. And I believe a lot of the black ops kinds of military exercises, false flags that seem to happen do have an occult element to it. Um, there are so many videos in regards to this where people have analyzed and broken down the geometria and the numerology and all of this stuff and it has occult significance like you can line up the dominoes in terms of what exactly is going on and it keeps linking to these occult numbers and occult um you know, ritual types things. So many of these military exercises do have an occult element, and this one seems to have that as well. And uh, the Crowley connection, I'm not sure if they have another uh, excerpt about it, uh, is also significant in regards to um, this particular hotel, as well as the history of the hotel. Because um, when you have a series of serial killers and all of these weird events, Black Dahlia also has a lot of occult overtones. Um, this could have been a hotel that is a front, essentially, set up where they do a lot of these experiments and they play out a lot of rituals and it is sometimes serial killers are not just random people but are actually people who have been through institutions have been um gone through trauma training mk ultra style trauma training and then released into the public to do very specific acts and you know publicly they're then known as all oh, these infamous serial killers but they were not acting um on their own they were given directions and many of them say that they're directly being given directions in their mind um and people just think oh they're having illusions or delusions but, or the schizophrenic or whatever, they have all kinds of excuses, but there are military grade um, equipment that is able to actually, uh, with microchips and various things that they have not released to the public, uh, you know, cause people to think that they're hearing voices. And especially when these people have a history of being institutionalized, it's very possible that they had been sequestered into the uh, private programs like the Lazarus program or whatever, Lazarus project, um, where they're being trained to be killers, um, sent out into the world and, and then kind of brought back in, uh, without anybody kind of realizing what they were actually involved with. And they themselves can never explain it because they don't understand the technology that was being used on them. So, um, there, since this hotel seems to have a lot of these references and there are Crowley references, he was, um, I think this will come up a little bit later, but anyway, he was, uh, the, the character that he was, um, talking to, I mean, having, uh, what do you call it, uh, automatic writing with, was a character named Lamb. And, uh, you know, he was also involved with, with something, I don't know if he was staying at the Cecilia Hotel. There was, there was a lot of stuff going on that sort of relates Crowley to this too, in a way. But anyway, I do think this movie might have been uh, 
discussion room or whatever they called it um, that was being displayed with this elevator video. But then there is this other aspect which I just think cannot be dismissed. Um, so this was the idea that she was a tuberculosis drug test subject. As it turns out, the time frame during which Elisa Lam was staying at the Cecil Hotel coincided with a severe tuberculosis outbreak on Skid Row and in most of the downtown area surrounding the hotel. The strange part is the TB test being used in the area was the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay called LAM ELISA for short. Also, isonazid is the most commonly used antibiotic for TB patients, and its side effects include confusion and abnormal behavior. Lamb's toxicology screening didn't find anything strange in her system, but many conspiracy theories think the drug test results were forged or altered in some way because of all the delays in the report's release. There are those who also think Eliza Lamb never existed, and this case was fabricated to distract from an international, intentional government-sponsored TB outbreak and testing. This would ensure anyone who tries to research the test, Lam Elisa, would only be met with a flood of information about Eliza Lam. So, what is weird about this whole thing? I think has to do with the name of the test. It is just too bizarre that it would be named the same name, but just backward, similar to the way that her Twitter account was just her name, but backward. Um, if this was a military exercise, and I think that this was a dual military exercise, so I looked up information about this test and the particular strain of TB that the people outside the hotel got. Okay, so this particular strain of uh, tuberculosis did not grow well in a petri dish. So they were unable to um, incubate it in a petri dish. So they found that the only way that it grew properly was in a human host. So what if Elisa Lamb was that human host? Now the body um, could have been infected at any point during the three weeks that um, she was in the tank. The water then would be infested with this tuberculosis strain. Now, the Skid Row people that were homeless people living outside of the hotel used to drink water from the, um, uh, you know, the there was a, what do you call it, like a pipeline that they were drinking water from that was running alongside the bottom of the hotel for using for cleaning or whatever, but that's where they were getting their water from. All of these people, it was a couple of thousand of them, uh, got infected with this very bizarre strange of tuberculosis. Now, the individuals of the hotel did not get infected with it, even though they were the ones who were complaining about the dark water and the this and the that. Um, I don't believe that the tank that Elisa Lamb was in was the tank that was servicing the hotel because that tank uh, was up to the top. Remember, the guy said she was only 12 inches from the top of the tank, so it was not the one that was in use for the hotel. The one that was in use were the other tanks that were much lower, and the water was being used by a full hotel, but you know, hotel full of people. Now, were those complaints legitimate about the water situation? Um, it was only really four people that came on television that claimed these problems with the hotel water, that it was coming out dark and that it was tasting weird and all of this stuff. Like like the Reddit um, thread claimed there was a gross out factor that they were focusing on. It was also related to how that they were talking about it in the movie. Um, I have a feeling that those people were plants and, uh, you know, were told to give this information because one, the entire hotel would have been infected or two, the entire hotel would have been complaining. Also, they
they only started complaining right on the day that um, the guy then went up to go and find her. So I think it was done on purpose so that they actually go up and remove the body because the experiment was over. Uh, nobody was going to look at that water tank otherwise. So, you know, to create a little bit of a frenzy, you put in a couple of phone calls, you have a couple of people. These were the only people that showed up on camera um, or in a variety of interviews saying the exact same thing. Uh, you know, like literally word for word as if it was a planned statement over and over again, um, which makes me feel they were slightly crisis actors in that capacity. You know, they might have been staying at the hotel, whatever, maybe they were paid to do it. Um, maybe there was a weird taste in the water, I don't know. But uh, nobody in the hotel was affected. The people that were affected were the outside people, the homeless people, which is where uh, a test like this, um, a real life study would be done on a transient population that nobody is looking after or aware of or are going to follow up on and that are not going to sue and, uh, you know, that are in a position that is very vulnerable. Um, and so I think that they were being tested on. Um, and then when the test's name is the exact same name as the girl's name who is in the tank, I mean, come on, that is too much. And they love doing these sort of, you know, word games, things like that. Um, it's like, you know, part of their MO where you see a lot of these words flipped and different letters and, and you know, it makes the same word and um, stuff like that. They, they do stuff like this. This is like a signature. So I just don't think that it is a possibility even for um, a girl to have like this French first name, uh, uh, you know, a Chinese last name, and then for the test that happens to be used for this very specific strain of TB that breaks out right at the hotel based on the water supply that was being given to these people that were outside that they were using, um, is also named the exact same name, like, you know, just flipped. I just don't think that that's a possibility as, um, you know, oh, it just is random. No way. This, I think, is a signature of it being that particular uh, a, a military exercise. I think there were two exercises that were happening. I think they were showing off some of the technology with this particular um, company that was run by this guy who has various military connections. And I think that the um, TB test was also part of it. And I think that she was um, a test subject for this particular thing because, you know, she, they required a human host in order for this test, uh, for in order for the TB to grow. It only grew in a human host. And it takes uh, three weeks for the intubation to be complete. And that's how long she was in there. The water would be contaminated and it was uh, being supplied to the, all of the people that got the actual infection. Now, the other clue um, that has to do with this particular strain of TB is that it causes anal bleeding. And if you recall, in her tet in her uh, coroner's report, she was exhibiting that. Now, they were saying it's from the long time in the particular situation. Some people are saying that she wasn't tested um, for assault. That's true, but it also happens to be a effect of this particular strain that it causes that. It also causes um, a lot of manic style behavior. So it's possible that she was uh, infected with it at a certain point and then she was left in that tank on purpose. She was basically a host for the thing to grow and, and then it was, um, you know, in the water supply and then the water supply affected a very particular group of people, not the hotel people, but the people outside. Um, and then the test is got her name on it, which is just too much for me. So I just feel that that is probably what was going on, that this was a dual military 
you know, make people think that, oh, this is somebody, you know, they kept pushing that she's bipolar. Um, so most people viewing the video on the news would just say, oh, okay, so something, she was having an episode and um, dismiss it right after that, which is the point of showing a video like that. Not that there are, you know, strange activities going on in the video. The elevator door is not closing for a full four minutes. She's clearly on display for some reason. She's talking to somebody. A minute of the video is missing. Her phone is missing, but there is still uh, blog posts coming from it. She has some sort of a an acquaintance that is involved with the military. She tweets about a company that specializes in, um, you know, submersion rooms and submersion AI technology, light technology, um, to create these submersion environments. And they have an office at the hotel. And then this whole TP situation where she is actually showing symptoms. She is in the tank for the right period of time. And the people outside get the exact strain that, um, the test that has her name on it, uh, also is, the, you know, involved with. It's just too much stuff, which I feel is involved with some kind of a milita dual military exercise. I think two things were being displayed with this particular case. There was one other aspect, um, which, I, well, two other things that I don't think were discussed in any of the, um, and they were discussed in maybe two of the documentaries that I was watching. Okay, so remember the woman that she met just before she, um, you know, at the bookstore. Okay, so the woman that she, and she did a lot of interviews, like there are at least 10 interviews of her saying the exact same thing of, um, you know, she came into the bookstore and she's all excited and is buying books for her parents because she's leaving the next day. Anyway, this bookstore, the last bookstore has a strange name. Um, the uh, parent company, like when you look up like who owns this, is the funeral home that Elisa Lamb is supposedly buried in. So that is another weird fact. Not that that just happened randomly with somebody trying to post a clue that there's something strange about this location, this hotel, the whole operation that's going on in this hotel. This could be a, a, a government front where they experiment on people in this particular location because it has a transient population. It's very easy to get away with things. And you have this whole series of history of events that are happening, which seem to sometimes have government link-ups. Okay, so there's that. The other issue was when they found her in the tank, they found a strange substance sprinkled on her clothes. Um, they could not identify it. It was not the gravel from the ground. It was something sticky and it was sprinkled all over her clothes. Uh, they never identified what it was. They didn't know what it was. And um, I'm suspicious about what it was as well. D does that substance have something to do with how the light technology of the submersion room is that some part of it meaning remember how these people uh, what they're promoting is that you don't have to wear the vr device um to see the things that you're seeing in that submersion room but what if you have to be sprayed with something and that's part of how you know some of the special effects are done with some sort of reflective material that is sprayed on the individual which nobody has any information about because it's a military level, uh, you know, invention and not released to the public. And I think that's also possible because they don't know what that substance was. Um, the other thing that they mentioned in a couple of videos, but then there is no footage of it, which is bizarre to me. It was even mentioned on the news that there are two videos of her. One is this hotel thing, which they promoted the heck out of. The other is a video of her entering the hotel. And she, uh, she is entering the hotel with two individuals who hand her a box. And she takes the box and then goes to the elevator. They have not released that video. Who the heck are these people? Why are they giving her a box? What is in the box? And, you know, what is that aspect about? This is why I think that this was a military-style operation. I think that the person that she met at that lunch date where she lost her phone um, was directing her to 
certain activities. I think they went up and met with a certain uh, group of people that then, you know, handed her something and wanted to make sure that she got to her location and was going to carry out the rest of the mission, not that she was going to go running around L.A. on her last day, but was going to finish whatever it was that she was supposed to do. They hand her a box. What was in the box? Was the box infected with uh, tuberculosis? Was, you know, was she going to get sprayed if she opened the box? I mean, we don't know what the hell was in the box, but something... It's, it's very bizarre that she's handed something, and then that is not recovered in her uh, belongings. They find the books that she was carrying from the bookstore, so this happened between her trip to the bookstore and entering the hotel. So somebody, you know, goes in with her, hands her this box. It's captured on video. She goes up to the room, and then the rest of the evening plays out this bizarre behavior with the elevator, and and then she ends up in the tank. The other thing about the tank, uh, which is significant, I think, uh, because it also lends to a um, occult kind of black psyop type action, is the fact that there was something written on the tank, uh, freshly written, um, like a graffiti, basically, written in big Latin, which translated to, I am done with her. Now, if you recall one of the other cases that I read about, which was also a spy kind of uh, military action, was the um, Australia case of the man who was found on the beach, and in his, um, uh, you know, in his belongings, they had this uh, little excerpt from a book where it says, to mom should, it is done. Uh, these are usually little aspects of closing a spell or closing an action. Remember, a lot of these black ops, for whatever reason, are associated with occult activity. And you can say, oh, it's a sacrifice or it's a this or that. It doesn't really matter what they're actually trying to do, but they do follow a certain protocol. There is a lesser magic, which is uh, the predictive programming. There's the actual event, which is the actual spell, and then they have to close the spell, and usually it's closed with some kind of words or acknowledgement, and both of these seem to have a very similar ring to them. It is done, and I am done with her. Uh, so I have a feeling that the individual that she was involved with, that she went and met when she was in Los Angeles, that probably encouraged her to come to Los Angeles, and then, um, you know, conduct all of these other activities, stay at this particular hotel, maybe meet up with those two other people who probably stole her cell phone and was, you know, updating the cell phone, that that individual is also the person um, who she was talking to that was off camera. Now, was that individual on camera for the one minute that was erased from the tape? Again, the police never give any reasoning for why they released a doctored tape with one minute missing. Who the hell was on that one minute? What is going on? Why do, why do we have a, a sped up tape that is also missing a single minute? That's, I mean, a lot can happen in a minute. So, um, something is going on. This girl did not climb up that tower or climb through a window or do all of those things on her own. The scent is dropped right at the window. I believe she was carried the rest of the way. She did not walk those steps. She had no gravel on her shoes. She uh, was carried up and you need strength to be able to even go up those stairs on your own. So she didn't do that by herself. She didn't close the, the top on top of herself either. Um, it doesn't make any sense. She just would not have had the strength to do all of these things. So I believe she was carried and I believe it was by the same person that she met that day and uh, the same person that I think also took her phone and was updating it and I think that was also involved with this, um, you know, light immersion room situation that has a connection with the South Korean military and, um, 
went up there also knows how to stop the alarm and do all of these activities and they would know that um, if they were involved with this hotel on a regular basis meaning they either worked there or uh, they you know this is an entire front hotel to begin with something is very suspicious but I do think that her particular death was a display of two uh, military actions one was this submersion technology that this uh, person that she tweeted about um, was involved with that's what they do and has military connections and it was also I think a dual ac action of this TB particular strain of tuberculosis that the um, transient population outside of the hotel caught on mass and then it was never followed up the fact that her name is on the test I think is the clue that this is a, a, a an activity that was planned you know and they're, they're just I don't see any other way around that I just cannot believe that that would be a coincidence um, in terms of the location and what happened and the fact that they needed a human host to do all of these activities. Now the question is why was she chosen of all of the people on earth? Um, there is, a, you know, there were just a couple of Reddit threads that related her family to military, the military in China before coming to, um, the, you know, uh, coming to Canada. But I did not find any further information. Was this kid chosen from the, you know, an early age? Because a lot of uh, military kids are sometimes used in experimentation. Their parents may not understand the level of how much, um, you know, this is done because they're basically picked from the daycare systems. So they're military daycare systems. And, um, you know, certain kids are picked for their, you know, tendencies, their gullibility or their believability, or sometimes it has to do with their blood type and has, you know, nothing to do with anything else but their genetics. Um, so there are a lot of examples of this. And she may have been chosen from a much earlier date which is even more sinister, like, you know, that her entire life was planned in this capacity. It's possible that she was just chosen in the last couple of years, but it seemed like she got involved with this individual while she was blogging, like while she was in college. So um, I, I'm not totally sure when her involvement with this actually took place, how much planning was involved. The test... Um, was developed. It had a different name originally. So the test was developed five years prior. And uh, there's also a little bit of a link up with the movie Departed, where they have a little um, picture of an Asian girl that something is written in a bathroom where they have this picture um, and it says, where is Elisa or something like that. And that movie came out several years ago too. So I don't know if that was a, like how many years does this stuff, uh, is this planned in advance? I don't know. But uh, that is another movie, you know, side note. But it's not a picture of her. It's just a picture of an Asian girl. And, but then the name is there. And why the heck is that even in the movie? It's just a single, um, you know, piece of paper hanging in a bathroom stall in a scene that has nothing to do with that. Uh, so that's another side note, but that could be a predictive programming thing as well. I think the movie Dark Water, though, um, has all of the predictive programming elements in it that make this seem like, you know, it falls into that category of a an action that was um, meant, you know, for public display, but it actually has um, a lot of other aspects to it for insiders to view. And I think that this is what is going on with this case. And I think that's probably why it has taken on such a life of its own in terms of people just being enamored with it and trying to figure out what the heck happened because there's so many weird clues and anomalies associated with it that it can't be dismissed as just coincidence or manic event or this or that. Something else was going on and I just feel that some of these clues point to a military ex 
exercise. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm so sorry it took such a long time to put this up. I, this is literally the third time I've recorded this. Um, I've been trying to get it up for the longest time, and I don't know what, what has been going on that I have not been able to, so I hope, hope, hope that this gets to you and you enjoy it, and I hope you guys have a great night, um, and stay safe, and I will talk to you again soon, hopefully. Okay, bye, guys.